It's ECCB Digital Dialogues, a special public engagement series designed for you as we navigate this pandemic together. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is your bank. We work for you, and it's our privilege to serve you in this period. Tonight, we recognize that many of us are anxious, some perhaps even depressed, about our current economic and financial situation. And so our focus this evening is on pandemic and faith. And our th th theme is hope in the face of adversity. Hope in the face of adversity. Someone has actually suggested that a person could live 40 days without food, perhaps eight days without water, maybe eight minutes without air, but a person cannot survive more than one minute without hope. And so our focus tonight is on hope in the face of adversity. And I'm reminded of Romans 12, 12, which always exhorts us to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. It's a scripture I love very much. Some people perhaps this evening are wondering, well, what does faith have to do with the central bank? or the central bank with faith. And I will merely make the simple observation that in almost every one of our constitutions in our member countries, our constitutions affirm our faith in the supremacy of God. But this is not a constitutional matter this evening. Faith is personal. And in this time and in this moment, we want to ensure that we speak to where people are at. And so the question is, is there a role for faith at a region crafts a response to this pandemic? If so, what is that role? What is the role of the church? Well, these and many other questions will be addressed tonight. And we have an excellent panel to assist us with those questions. And I'll introduce our panel shortly. But before we get to our panel, a few housekeeping announcements. First, this dialogue is being streamed live on the ECCB Connects Facebook page. Attendees in the Zoom session will have their microphones muted and cameras turned off to ensure the smooth flow of the dialogue. Attendees are invited to submit their comments in the chat box and your questions in the Q&A box. So remember, chat box for Comments, Q&A for questions. As moderator, I will read all those questions and I will pose them or direct them to our panel. We have a colleague from the Central Bank monitoring our Facebook page and will direct questions from that page to us so that the panel can also have an opportunity to respond to those questions. As always, we encourage a respectful dialogue and we have no doubt that you will do that this evening. If for whatever reason uh, we are disconnected or we lose connectivity, we ask you to simply log on or return using the link previously provided. And as always, the dialogue will be recorded and uh, available on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel, ECCB Connects, for your viewing after this event. So with that, I want to welcome everyone this evening to our digital dialogues. We have a number of radio stations and television stations uh, which have joined us, and I will uh, name them a little later on, but I want to thank them as well, several of them that have joined us this evening for this live broadcast. And so with that, I now propose to introduce our panel. First is Pastor Lincoln Connor, who is the lead pastor of the Antioch Baptist Church in St. Kitts, 
Uh, the Antioch Baptist Church is one of the largest churches in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Pastor Connor has pastored that church for almost 20 years. And I know you're wondering, how could this young man have pastored for all this time so long? Child labor must have been the law of the land um, those 20 years ago, but I, I don't think so. Um, you will hear from him shortly. But Pastor Connor is also uh, a trained teacher and taught for, for several years. Uh, he has several qualifications, including master's degrees in counseling and master's degrees in biblical studies. And so we're very pleased to have Pastor Connor join us this evening. Pastor Connor, good evening and welcome. Good evening to, to you, Governor, and to our listening audience. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And uh, I must say, as someone who lives in the Federation, Pastor Connor has done excellent work in this pandemic, and uh, I thank him for all of his work. And now I'd like to introduce Bishop Malzair. Bishop Malzair has been a priest for 35 years, believe it or not. And he has been the Bishop of Roseau for almost 20 years. He has several qualifications, including a doctorate in sacred theology, Bishop Malze has worked in several countries, including, I believe, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Dominica. Uh, he's well known around the region. He's a former president of the Dominica Christian Council, and I believe he's the current president of the uh, bishops. Uh, I believe they're called the Antilles Episcopal Conference of the Bishop of the Antilles, AEC. Uh, Bishop Malze is the current president of the group. Bishop, good evening and welcome. Good evening, Governor. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. And thank you for accepting the invitation, sir. Most welcome. Very good. And then I'd like to uh, introduce a female panelist, a powerful woman of faith, Sister Joycelyn Truitt, Truitt from the Emerald Isle called Montserrat. Sister Tewitt is a ordained Methodist minister and preacher. She leads several ministries, including women's ministries, children's ministries, missions, and evangelism. She's well known in the community, and we're very pleased that we have Sister Tewitt on this evening. Sister Tewitt, good evening and welcome. Good evening, Governor, and thanks for having me. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, those of us who are people of faith know the power of women in our household of faith. So there's no way we could have a panel without a powerful woman of faith. So thank you, Sister, for joining us this evening. And so we're looking forward to this very important dialogue. And without further ado, I'd like to go to the panel. Now, just for those who are perhaps new, uh, I want to just remind you of the run of show or the flow. It's essentially a three-segment dialogue. We begin with some direct questions from the moderator to the panelists. Thereafter, we will have a poll where we ask you, the audience, questions. I believe tonight we have three questions lined up for you and you get an opportunity to answer those questions. And then the third segment, which is typically our longest segment, is where you, the audience, viewing and listening, get to ask questions of the panelists. And uh, usually uh, we, have a, we have a good exchange. Well, we go for about 90 minutes, but we can go up to two hours if necessary. Um, so we will, as the spirit leads this evening. So with that, I now would like to begin by addressing uh, some questions to our panel. This first question, uh, I'm going to ask each member of the panel to comment. So here's the question. The COVID-19 pandemic has occasioned a massive economic and financial fallout with many lives globally. Thankfully, very few lives have been lost in the ECCU, but many livelihoods have been lost or are now at risk. 
Here at the Central Bank, we estimate that GDP will contract this year between 10 and 20 percent, and that is going to be the largest on record. What is the role of faith in helping our people and our region to respond to our current adversity? What is the role of faith in our response? And I'd like to start with Bishop Malze on Bishop. Yeah, could you just unmute your mic? Yes. Well, thank you very much, very good. Uh, Governor. Um, first of all, I would like to, to say that the Holy Scriptures, which is really the basis of, of our faith, um, it is it has it provides ample evidence of the people of God in moments of crises. We can give examples from ancient time. We have the the the, the situation of the the flood of of, of Noah. Um, we have the slavery into Egypt, uh, the exile in Babylon. Uh, all these in the Old Testament were moments of crisis for the people of God. In the New Testament, we have the death of Jesus himself, which was a moment of crisis, especially for those who were his followers. Then the persecution in the early church. The early church was heavily persecuted because it was a small group of people who were seeking um, a, a certain way of life and uh, the majority of the pagan society were not in sync with it. So it was a moment of persecution. So what I'm laying here is the fact that human beings in general have been accustomed with crisis situation. In more modern times, we can say that um, we had the financial meltdown in 2008. Um, and then we have, um, I could speak in terms of Dominica, Erica and, uh, and, and Maria. These were uh, challenging moments. And now we have COVID. Um, all the situations that have been experienced in the past, human beings have reason above them. So it is not new to us. We are, uh, human beings are accustomed with dealing with crises. So people of faith have been journeying with each other, trying to overcome challenges throughout life. And therefore, a new pandemic is just another one. And therefore, despite the fact that it certainly takes us at moments that we would not expect and uh, challenges us in a, in, in a new way, nevertheless, uh, the faith of people are sufficient to help them to navigate through it. Now, um, so faith has always been challenged in time of adversity, but human beings have been resilient and they have sought to, to overcome those challenges. So human suffering is not new to, 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 to humanity. So we have been able to develop measures to deal with those, those situations. For a Christian, the focus of their hope and their faith is in Jesus Christ. And the point of departure for that faith is the fact that Jesus came, he preached, he died, and he rose again. So the kind of faith and hope that we have is a, resurrection, a resurrectional one. That it tells us that no matter what happens, no matter what situations we may experience, there is a hope because our Lord, the one whom, in whom we put our faith, he did not stay in the ground. Even the ground could not hold him. And therefore, um, the faith that we have is such that nothing, no pandemic is able to overcome the faith that human beings have. Okay, some people will die. Some people will, be, will, will succumb to it. Nevertheless, um, there is enough that people can do to surpass those challenges. So this is providing the context. Now, in the midst of all that, we have the question of the loss of jobs, you know, 
um, people uh, dying, uh, people being afraid, and all these. I think the scriptures provide ample opportunities for us to understand um, how we can overcome. We have situations in, in, the, in the Holy Scriptures, like, you know, you quoted earlier on um, Romans chapter, chapter 12. Um, we have Romans chapter 8, in which um, St. Paul is saying, for I consider the suffering that, we, that we, we, we experience in this present life cannot be compared with what is to come. We have in that same chapter, verse, verse 35, it says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Should tribulation, should disease, should persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, nothing, it says, can overcome because of faith that we have. So this is providing a context for, for the, the belief that we have that despite all the challenges that we can have as human beings, that we can overcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop, for that very um, encouraging lead on this very important subject. Thank you very much. Uh, Pastor Connor, what say you? Well, you know, faith, when we think of faith, uh, to add to what the bishop said, I believe that faith holds us together. Uh, it, it, it keeps us together so that when the tough times come, we don't fall apart. I believe that uh, in our understanding of faith, the individual who has that uh, belief in God and a trust in his faithfulness and a reliance on, on the fact that he is sovereign, his sovereignty directs our lives. It helps to provide a sense of identity to the individual, simply because to my mind, it helps us to appreciate that we can't find meaning outside of, uh, of, outside of God. And, and, and we have to ensure that the identity that we have is in God and know that there will be tough times. And so when those tough times come, faith tends to hold us together so that there is a satisfaction in knowing that God is leading us even though the night may be dark and we may not be able, able to see where we are going. And as David says, we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We are able to say like um, Horatius Fafford that when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever, whatever, whatever my lot, God, you have taught me to say it is well. And, and that it, it is well comes from that uh, internal sense of peace uh, that comes from that uh, unshakable, settled faith that we have in God. And so uh, to my mind, I believe that in this current situation, Faith helps to move us through the difficulties, recognizing that in as much as there is suffering, there is a God who understands and is touched with the feelings of our infirmity. And outside of that faith in God, then we would all fall apart. But because of this faith in God, it helps us not merely you know, to, to, to stand up and not be fragile, but it helps us to grow under the pressure. Because I think that faith, when the pressure starts bearing down on us, it is not merely that we won't crumble, but because we have faith, we begin to grow under the pressure. And so I think that in this situation, having that faith that is unshakable, unmovable, in a God who we trust and we believe and we rely on and we know that he is sovereign gives us a sense of peace within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. A sense of peace. Peace in the midst of the storm. Thank you. That's right. Yes. The situate, what's your view on this matter? As a believer, I can see hope, 
and I can see opportunity. Let me explain. There's unemployment, massive unemployment. I see positives in that. A lot of these persons, because of the tourist industry, they were, carried, they were holding two and three jobs, working long hours, and the children were suffering. A lot of those children, they found themselves in gangs and in the wrong company. But now the parents are home, so when school is out, they can go home and have adult supervision. Their lessons, somebody will be there to guide them or to see that they do their lessons. Previously, our coral reefs were, they were practically dying. And just a few months that there are no tourists in our area, there are signs of recovery. As we go, we look at um, our import bill. Right now, persons are not working. They have less money to buy the exotic fruits and vegetables from overseas. So they're now forced to use their local fruits and vegetables, which are more nutritious. Some of them, they have anti-inflammatory um, characteristics. Some have anti-cancer characteristics. Now, we're forced to use those because we have less money to spend. God has given us fertile soil, and we can grow our own food, feed our own self, feed our children. Previously, we fed our children with sodas and junk food. Now, we have to utilize our local produce. Here in Montserrat, when it's mango season, the mangoes are all over the ground. The guavas are on the trees, they fall on the ground. Nobody is using them. But now that there's a limited finances, we're forced to use this. So I see that God has brought us to this place so that we can appreciate what he gave to us. Now we are forced to use our resources. We look again at um, global warming. When um, the metropolitan countries had their lockdown, the scientists found that um, the nitrogen dioxide levels and the carbon dioxide levels, they were reduced. They were reduced to the point that asthmatic patients heart patients and persons with issues with their lungs, they were having no problems. The Indians were seeing the Himalayas for the very first time after centuries, after decades. So the lockdown because of COVID caused us to have cleaner ears and our problem right now is air pollution. We can see the results. Terrible hurricane, powerful hurricanes, rising sea levels, rising temperatures in the sea. All of that we can see. So God now, I'm saying, God is showing us what we're doing wrong and he's giving us an opportunity to make our wrongs right. Because if we continue down this path, we'll be killing ourselves and our food security would be threatened because the fish and the coral and the mammals in the sea, they would be destroyed. They would not survive in the rising temperatures. Our ice caps are melting and it's going to cause flooding. So God in his wisdom just put us on hold. He stopped us. So I can see positives and I can see hope in this whole COVID situation because it's calling us now to relook at the whole picture. And that is how I take this, um, this crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sister Truitt. So uh, a wake-up call and, and also a call for us to reconsider our mandate in respect of environmental justice, uh, among other things. Um, and perhaps we might pick those up as we continue the conversation. So thank you very much, uh, panelists. Uh, I'd like to continue now with a question to Bishop Nazaire. Bishop, what do you say to skeptics, cynics, and critics who may argue that addressing this pandemic is strictly a matter for scientists mm -hmm. and there is no place for faith in our response to this pandemic? What well, do you say to them? I would say it is, um, there is a certain level of short-sightedness in that, in that regard. Uh, first of all, human life consists of varied dimensions. Psychological, emotional, and spiritual. And all these are areas of need that are to be met. Then the means of meeting those needs are varied. On the level of faith, we have the responsibility of sustaining the hope of the believer on the level of faith. However, that believer is a physical being and a psychological being too. And so, in responding to the needs of that individual person, that human being, they are to face the realities that exist around them. And of course, the pandemic, um, COVID-19, is such, such a reality. So we cannot not deal with it. So the mission of science is to help us to understand the realities that surround us. But that is not opposed to faith. It is not opposed to faith. Christian theology always teaches, and, of, and philosophy too, they hold the tension between faith and reason, and they are not opposed to each other. Both are necessary to provide a wholesome picture of the human person and his needs, faith and reason. So despite the fact that science is absolutely necessary to assist us to navigate through um, the pandemic as it is in a pr in practical sense, even the implementation of measures that will be required to, to alleviate the, 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 the pandemic, faith would be, will be needed. The participation of people of faith will be needed for discipline or whatever uh, measures are to be taken. That would be, that comes into play as well. Any scientist would know that science in itself does not have all the answers to all the questions that are possible among human beings. So science never has the entire answer. The pandemic is here with us. We have to deal with it. But in the process of maybe seeking a vaccine, do we say that, oh, let us wait for what science tells us and then we will, we will get all the solutions to the problems and the challenges that we have? You have a people of faith who believe that and who are looking forward towards, towards solution to, to the challenges that they have. And there are many of them. So in order to respond to the, 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 the pandemic, which of course um, science has a way or is responsible to guide us through and to help us understand, to help us unravel the situation that is before us. But religion, faith, has a responsibility to help those who are within the experience to navigate through it. And I think giving people hope in the midst of challenges such as a pandemic is very difficult. One of the, the, the issues that, that often come, comes up in, um, in such situations is one of mental illness. Coping with mental illness when everybody is under pressure. We would know that the lockdown that we had, it created a situation where people were tired of staying at home. They were, uh, uh, the, the, the level of, of mental illness 
was rising. What would give people hope to be sustained in such situation? Is it science or is it faith that gives people? You know, during the Easter season this year, um, it was really in the middle of the lockdown. And it was the time when everybody was able to stay home and uh, follow the liturgical services, the prayer services over Zoom or over the air. Um, the big advantage that people spoke of, of is the fact that people were able to come together as family. Some people never experienced family in the way that they did. In fact, some of the faithful in the Catholic Church, I mean, Dominica said that they had a new understanding of things that they had been celebrating for years because they were able to stay home and experience it as family. Now, these are all dimensions of faith that in the midst of a lockdown because of a pandemic, there is a certain a new lease, a new understanding, a new um, way of, of, of seeing reality. Even if there are great restrictions, however, it provided for people uh, a kind of setting, a kind of context in which they could have a, a, a different vision. So I would say that while science helps us to unravel the understanding of the pan pandemic and what is to be done, like providing a vaccine in the future, uh, in the midst of it, faith is necessary to keep people sane, to keep people you know, functioning, to keep people psychologically stable, to keep people spiritually nourished, to keep people alive, I would say. That's mm -hmm. what I was here on this part. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and of course, we cannot forget the fact that some of our very hardworking frontline warriors, as I call them, mm -hmm. the health workers have, in fact, some of them succumbed yes. um, to the disease, but others have also become so despondent about perhaps the response to the disease and so on, that some of them lost hope. Yes. And for many, those who are people of faith, what has sustained them in this period is not their knowledge of the disease, but their faith in their God mm -hmm. to help them, as you said, the mental fortitude. In the, in, in the face of great adversity. Um, so for those of us who are people of faith, we, we appreciate that. We are, understand that not everybody, uh, I suppose, exercises that faith. There are people's right to faith lessness, if you, if you want to call it that. Yeah. But for many, many of us, faith has been a great sustainer, our faith in our God, a great sustainer in the spirit. And I could attest to that personally, no question about that. Yes. Uh, so if I can add yeah. on uh, um, yes. to what uh, the um, bishop was saying, indeed, I think we have to acknowledge um, the, the, the holistic uh, uh, development of individuals and to appreciate that, uh, as mentioned by the, the bishop, that we are whole entire individuals and, and the, the entire system has to be fed. I mean, in the context of faith, uh, the church uh, operates within a community. And I think that that faith community is absolutely necessary as the scripture tells us that, you know, I mean, iron sharpened iron. And when we come together, we can build each other. We can grow and feed from each other. That is why even during the, the lockdowns and we had um, virtual and digital and, and all different types of uh, uh, engagements, it was still not the same uh, as uh, coming together because there is something that nourishes and feeds the soul. And I think that that engagement is absolutely necessary in terms of having the individual appreciate the, the overall impact of faith in their lives. To the extent, as you mentioned, Governor, that we find today, even in the healing process, that doctors are sending patients home and say, go and let the church pray for you. 
which was something unheard of before, but they are coming to terms with the reality and the impact of faith in our hospitals, uh, nurses and doctors are, are glad to see members of the clergy because they know how that lightens their work, how that makes a difference in the life of the, the, the patient. And so that faith, as I said earlier, helps us to move through the tough times without falling apart. And so I think that understanding how that impacts individuals' life is critically important. Right, right, right. And, and I think um, it's already been said this evening that we are resilient people. And a lot of what undergirds our personal resilience is really our faith in God. Yes. We, we, we often don't name it as such. But when you look back on, even you go back to our history, yeah. the fact that we are descendants you know, of, of enslaved Africans and all of the hardship and adversity we endured across um, and then, of course, to, 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 to live under this most curial of situations, um, to deal with all that we've done within colonialism and all the challenges of small states in the post-independence period, all of the natural disasters and all the things that we face as a people. We have shown resilience. You know, I, I recall it, in, and I digress for a moment, but I recall in the 1960s, 70s, when uh, our countries were seeking independence, 70s and 80s for the, for the countries in the ECCU, uh, we, didn't, we weren't given a chance to survive. Mm -hmm. There were people who wrote us off. And if you look at the history books, really saw us as useless and unable to govern ourselves and, and find a way to make a living for ourselves. Yeah. And we have surpassed all expectations where that is concerned. Mm -hmm. And that isn't to say that we don't have our difficulties. No, we do. And, we, and, 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 and some of us would argue that we should be performing at an even higher level. But the point is that throughout all of those decades, uh, in fact, centuries of difficulty and adversity, uh, we have been shown to be resilient. And a big part of that is ultimately our faith in Almighty God. That's and right. We need, to, we need to recognize it for what it is and say it for what it is. But I want to stay with you, uh, Pastor Connor, and ask you this question. Um, from the outset of the pandemic, you know, I have exhorted, and you and I have collaborated on a number of things. I have exhorted us to have a growth mindset. And that mind is really an approach where we reframe our, pro reframe our problems as opportunities. Very important in this period. So as a faith leader, what opportunities and partnerships do you see emerging in this pandemic? What are some of those uh, opportunities and partnerships? Well, Governor, I... I, I support the whole idea of a growth mindset. I believe that anything that isn't growing is dead. So we need to constantly be green and be growing. I mean, the word tells us that Jesus himself grew, Luke 2, 52 in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. St. Paul emphasizes a lot about growth and maturity in the life of the individual. And so our work of faith is one of growth because we are growing even more in understanding that which we believe. And, and every day we are learning more about God and his word. Uh, Peter reminds us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And so I looked at this uh, season as an opportunity and a crisis not to be wasted. I believe that the, the, the church must always look for engagements to ensure that our message is carried out. For whatever it is worth, the focus must be the message and that message has a community that it needs to impact. And so when I look at the, the pandemic, I see opportunities and I see our partnerships that we can engage in. And, and when I think of the opportunities, first of all, I think of the, the, the opportunity to amplify the message. I think that this is a very important time in, in, in history where the message of the church, that message of faith and the hope and deliverance and renewal can be amplified and made larger in, in so many different ways. When we think of uh, how we do ministry, uh, we, we begin to think of the necessity of uh, amplifying that message. 
we can now um, reach uh, hundreds and thousands of people by just sitting down before a computer screen opposed to uh, you know 20 and 25 in the congregation. But that said, we have to think of how to we um, imagine ministry opportunities in terms of reaching people. We keep people at the center because those of us who are, who are called to lead, I believe that God has given us a particular gifting mandate and capacity to do, to do the work that he has called us to do. And he has given us a heart to, to reach the people whom he wants us to reach, that great multitude uh, when we see to have compassion. And so we must think of how we are going to reimagine ministry and how we rethink and how we redo ministry so that uh, while the word remains consistent, the vehicle in which we carry the word is always being upgraded. And so there are a number of uh, opportunities that I see that we can engage in at this time. And uh, it is ensuring that one, the church embraces the technology that exists. I mean, those who are solidified in, 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 in the church in terms of their age, 50s, 60s, 70s, they're not going anywhere. Um, they're going to stay there. They believe in God. They believe in faith, whatever it is worth. Uh, they're always going to sing a song and they're always going to accredit everything to God. The, the new generation, those who are 30 years and younger, all that they know is your smart device. And, and, and if, it, to my mind, if, if the church does not reimagine how, it, how it's going to do ministry, then what is going to happen is the church will be out of sight and out of mind. Uh, because everything for these uh, individuals is technology. And if you don't have a presence, then um, you know, uh, individuals are not going to remember that you even exist. So I think it's important to have that presence in relation to the technology. But more importantly, I think it's an opportunity for the church to be innovative and to ensure that we now drive a uh, dynamic, unique experience. Uh, for the, the time is no longer available when individuals just went to church because the church was there and it was the thing that we all did. The church now has to justify why individuals should actually attend. And even now when you have so much uh, digital and virtual services, each congregation, in order to get individuals back into uh, the, the physical setting, must ensure that there is some unique experience that drives people back, and especially those younger individuals who we would term are generally as millennials. So these are opportunities for us to engage a new generation by using the platforms and the technologies that God has made available to us. But one of the things that I really believe is is important in, in this time in terms of uh, uh, an opportunity is for us to rethink uh, how we are going to do our church. I, I don't believe that the, the need is for another church. I don't think the need is for us to have another church. I think that it is important for us to rethink how we can network with churches that, that, that exist already because they are limited resources, um, limited manpower, limited finance, and, and, and individuals, as the bishop said earlier, they are uh, engaged in uh, situations where they've lost their employment and they are um, not working, and all these things put pressure on the church. And so what I think can, can do well for the church is if we begin to think of how the church can engage in what um, is called power church ministries, whereby, uh, you know, there are faith-based uh, uh, organizations 
that are going to work outside of denomination barriers and just work across boundaries to provide social welfare and evangelism to individuals. And this, to my mind, is a great opportunity for the church at this time, even in, in some areas where there is a, a, a high percentage of um, depression among the people in terms of the, the standard of living and that sort of thing. Instead of churches trying to struggle on their own and to survive, and you just have a few members, it doesn't take away uh, your identity as a church, but I think we need to see how we can create those power church uh, initiatives that are going to include uh, individuals from different denominations, but allow us to have the opportunity to impact more people uh, with the gospel and with uh, um, some sort of social relief in, in that regard. I, I don't know what your thinking is on, on this uh, vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, th th thank you. Thank you, Pastor okay. Connor. In fact, I mean, you, you have done some of that. I mean, I, I know you've reached out to um, mental health experts, um, counseling to, to, to provide support for people with mental health. I know you, are, you have supported entrepreneurship. And so when you spoke of the church partnering on, you know, parachurch activities, it, it's really, for example, health. The issue of health has arisen as a big issue in this period. Let's face it, the people who are suffering the chronic diseases, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart disease, they are more vulnerable at higher risk to this disease. Right. And so it has brought to the fore the issue of health and, of course, our primary health care, which is prevention. And the role of the church, some churches, for example, the Adventists have a stronger tradition in respect mm -hmm. of health and wellness. Other churches, less so. Uh, but in this moment, all churches, as you said, can work across denominational lines to address this issue of health and health of, 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 the, of the members uh, and of the community. Because we're seeing this is not just, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's really, you know, really now come to the fore as important for us to be able to, to survive this pandemic. Um, and tied to that is the issue of food security. And Sister Chewitt made the point earlier about us eating local food and healthy food. And uh, we cultivating a taste for local, but recognizing the importance of local food for our health and the role of the church, which has a captive audience, to be able to empower and, and it, it, its members um, to be able to understand these issues uh, and, and to be better able to, to, um, to help themselves in respect of this. And we could talk about financial literacy, uh, economic development, small business, uh, so there are a whole range of issues, you're right, that the church, some churches have done, but there's an opportunity for us to go to scale, uh, but we have to work across boundaries. We have to work with partners to be able to bring that expertise to, the, to, our, to our church members, to the community, uh, communities that we serve, and in so doing, empower them. Uh, and when we empower them, we not only empower churches, but we empower nations, we empower region uh, to, 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 to be better off uh, as a result of this pandemic. So lots of opportunities there. But Sister Tewitt, you might want to comment on the role of the church in this period. So I give you that opportunity as well. What say you? Muted. You, yes, just on mute, please. Right, there you go. Yeah, what I have here to say, it all fits in with what Pastor was saying. And it brings to mind James chapter 2, and I'm reading James chapter 2, 15 to 17. It says, If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is good? What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So I see the role of the church at this time. At this time, we have to put works in motion. We need to, yes, we preach about faith and hope and all of those nice things, but we need to put it in action. We need to leave the, the walls, the four walls of the church and get out into the community. 
There are persons over there, they're unemployed, and they're hurting. So my thing is, a lot of persons in the church, they are trained in pastoral care. We can assign persons to deal with persons who are depressed or persons who really they're burdened by the situation and they, they don't know what else to do. Apart from that, the church can have little projects. I know the churches, especially your churches, they have reserves. So they can use some of that reserve or get small grants to help some of these people. And I'm talking not just the church people, the persons mm -hmm. in the communities. Right. To set up little cottage industries. And then the right. church can help with labeling and packaging and maybe even marketing as well. Then these days, all of us have to wear masks. And I'm thinking the church, depending on the finances, they can get machines, set them up on the church property. And they can employ persons to make different sizes of masks and see if they can get a contract with the schools, the prisons, offices, and send them to the general public as well. And this way you can generate income to help these persons. And another thing, money is scarce. So the church can buy food items, buy them wholesale and sell them to these persons at cost price because that would help them greatly. And while the church is doing all of these things for these persons in the community, it would give them an understanding of who God really is. Because as you help them financially and emotionally and give them that support, you'll also be evangelizing at the same time. And personally, I think that even the unchurched will come to recognize that there is a loving and caring God. Just as the church is loving me and caring for me, well, God would do even more than that for me. And that would, I think that that can start a relationship with God, with them. So as they go through this crisis, they will understand God is not punishing me. God has plans for me. And this God, he can make the impossible possible. So now these persons who are ones in despair, they can feel some sort of hope just because of what the church you know, we'll be doing with it. So I think that, you know, the role of the church is very vital at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Chewett. So uh, thanks very much, uh, panelists, for your responses so far. I'm going to pause on the questions to allow us to um, Go to the second segment, and uh, we can always come back to some of the questions that we've not yet um, covered. Uh, and of course, we want to see what the audience may wish to pose to you as well. So at this moment, I'd like us to um, perhaps move to our second segment. So uh, I just want you to stay tuned. We're going to uh, share with you our broadcast partners, and we will also share with you the the matter of the, and we will also share with you the, the matter of the questions uh, which are coming up next. So just stay tuned. Uh, there's also a little ad we have on our Dcash. Those of you who are following the central bank closely will know that the launch of our digital currency called Dcash, which is short for digital cash, uh, that will be launched very soon in our currency union. And uh, we're getting ready for launch. And so we have a, a, a short uh, promo that we will show you in a minute to uh, just give you the latest on that. And we can start with the radio and broadcast partners. 
In Anguilla this evening, we have Radio Anguilla, Class FM, and Cool FM Radio. In Antigua and Barbuda, we have ABS Radio and Nice FM Radio. In Dominica, the Commonwealth of Dominica, we have Dominica Catholic Radio, DBS Radio, Vibes Radio, and Cari FM. In Grenada, there is GBN Classic 105, Sisters Radio, that's Karakou, and We FM. In St. Christopher and Nevis, there is Freedom FM and ZIZ Television. In St. Lucia, WVEN 93.5, 94.7 FM, and Rhythm FM. And in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have tonight Praise FM, NBC Radio, and Star Radio. We will also have this broadcast on stations. Uh, Montserrat Radio ZJB will broadcast this dialogue on Sunday, September 27 at 4 p.m. And here in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, Vaughan Radio on Friday, 25th September at 8 a.m. And Win FM 98.9 on Friday, 25th September at 2.30 p.m. So those uh, will take it subsequent broadcast. And now we go to our Dcash promo. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is proud to introduce Dcash, the official digital version of the EC dollar. Dcash is the safer, faster, cheaper way to send and receive payments within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, all using your smart device. For more information, visit the ECCB's website, Dcash, coming soon. ECCB Digital Dialogues, and tonight our focus is on pandemic and faith, and our theme is hope in the face of adversity. We now wish to go to the second segment of our dialogue, which is our audience poll. And this evening, we have three questions lined up for you. Those of you who are familiar with this would know that you have to put in your uh, computers, your devices, whatever you carry in, www.menti.com. So you go to www.menti.com. That's www.menti.com. And once you do that, the code tonight is 1687. Two two seven. I repeat, the code tonight is one six eight seven two two seven. You put that code in, and you will have three questions uh, to answer this evening. And so I will now. The questions will now appear, and uh, we'll start with question number one. So here's the first question for those who perhaps are listening via radio. Uh, the question is. What role has faith played in your ability to cope with the challenges brought on by this pandemic? What role has faith played in your ability to cope with the challenges brought on by this pandemic? And there are three responses. First, it has been essential. I lean heavily on my faith in difficult times. <clears throat> B, only a minimal role. C, my faith has been shaken. I have lost my faith. And actually, there's a, a, a fourth which is not applicable. So perhaps for people of, uh, who do not have faith uh, or do not exercise their faith, that might be their option. So I repeat, the question is, what role has faith played in your ability to cope with the challenges brought on by the pandemic? A, it has been essential. I lean heavily on my faith in difficult times. B, only a minimal role. C, my faith has been shaken. I have lost faith. And D, not applicable. So we uh, have the question uh, before us. Uh, we will give you another 30 seconds uh, to see what your responses are. And then we will move to our second question. So welcome tonight. If you just join us and wondering what we're talking about, this is ECCB Digital Dialogues. Our focus tonight is pandemic and faith. And our theme is hope in the face of adversity. Hope in the face of adversity. And we have with us on our panel tonight, Pastor Lincoln Connor of the Antioch Baptist Church in St. Kitts and Nevis, Bishop Marze, the Bishop of Roseau 
in Dominica, and Sister Joycelyn Tewitt from the Emerald Isle, which is Montserrat. Uh, those are our panelists uh, this evening. And so we final 10 seconds for the first question. What role has faith played in your ability to cope with the pandemic? And what we see here is that 90%, so I think we can close the poll at uh, this moment. We can close the poll. And what we see is that 90% of the responses have indicated that faith has been essential. They have lent heavily on their faith in this period. And certainly, that's the category in which I fall personally. Then the 5% said only a minimal role. And 3% said, my faith has been shaken, or I have lost my faith, 3%. And there's another 3% that says not applicable. So uh, there we can see 90% of the respondents have indicated that faith has been essential, has played an essential role in their coping with this pandemic. Thank you very much for your responses. We now go to question number two. Question number two says, do you think there is enough spiritual support available for affected persons during this pandemic? The question is, do you think there is enough spiritual support available for affected persons during this pandemic? And there are two responses, yes or no. Yes or no. Do you think that there is enough spiritual support available for affected persons during this pandemic? And let's be clear, all of us, each of us has been impacted by this pandemic. In case you're joining us, just joining us, this is ECTV Digital Dialogues, and our focus tonight is pandemic and faith, hope in the face of adversity. Uh, if you want to be part of this poll, you go to www.menti.com, and the code tonight is 1687227. We have three questions, and we're on question number two. Final 10 seconds for this question. Final 10 seconds for this question. And tonight we have working the poll for us is Lyndon Jackassel. Uh, Lyndon is a uh, former Bright Sparks. And I like to, because we talk a lot about supporting young people, I, I, I like to always speak of this program. We're very proud of our Bright Sparks program. Uh, Lyndon came through our Bright Sparks program and is now a permanent employee of the Central Bank. So he works in our IT department. And um, there's another bright spark. So we have this time a lady who's actually in the room also supporting us tonight, and her name is Janelle Brathwaite. Um, so I want to just hail these young people. By the way, all the other colleagues in the room are young as well. But these are particularly young people uh, who the Central Bank has given an opportunity um, to, to grow professionally to learn and to, and, to, and to contribute, which they are doing. Some of them are working, for example, on our Dcash project. And, you know, and, and, and so we're very pleased to have them. We know, we've now had, I believe, five bright sparks. And um, most of them, all of them, in fact, have come onto our permanent staff. And we plan to bring more of them. We usually go into our colleges or community colleges, state colleges, and we look for them. So we're looking for... Um, we've had from St. Lucia, St. Kitston, Nemes, Grenada, and I know we're looking for um, someone from Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda, Anguilla, Montserrat, St. Vincent and Grenadines. All eight of our member countries, they are looking to bring right sparks. So we have reached out to the community colleges. Some have been ready, some have not yet been quite ready to receive us, but uh, our expectation is to visit them. We may have to do that virtually now but uh, we continue to look for bright sparks. So thank you very much, Lyndon, for your work tonight. So let's go to the poll. And uh, question number two, we can now close that poll. Let's close that poll. And in closing, we see that the question was, do you think there's enough spiritual support available for persons affected by this pandemic? 43% of our respondents have said yes. 57% have said no. 43% said yes, 57% said no. So clearly, there is support, support on offer 
people have been availing themselves of support, but the slight majority, 57%, have indicated that not enough support is available. So uh, pastors, leaders of faith, uh, we have to take a look and see what else we could be doing to help in this period. Question number three, please. Question number three. Here's the question. What do you most need from your church at this time? What do you most need from your church at this time? And there are four options. Prayer, food, counseling, and that could be psychosocial or financial, and community. What do you most need from your church at this time? Is it prayer? Is it food? <coughs> is it counseling, be that psychosocial or financial, or is it community? And, 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 and uh, uh, Pastor Connor um, and others, certainly I remember Pastor Connor spoke about this issue of community earlier, and they coming together in this period, not being alone, standing together and sharing uh, in this period. That's community. And I believe, in fact, Bishop Mazem made a point uh, during the Easter liturgy, how people came together as a family, uh, came together in faith community to celebrate uh, the liturgy and to really begin to understand it in a new and more profound way. Uh, that's community. So uh, final 30 seconds for the third and final question. What do you most need from your church at this time? Is it prayer, food? Counseling or community? What is your greatest need? Final 10 seconds. And uh, we can now close the poll. Let's close. Let's close. The voting is now closed. And once we close the voting, we immediately give you the results. This is real time and the use of technology. No delay. So 24% of respondents said prayer, 0% said food, 20% said counseling, and 56% said community. I want to repeat the results of this poll. 24% of the people who responded said prayer, 0% said food, 20% said counseling, whether that's psychosocial or financial, they said counseling, 56% said community. So there you have it. Viewers and listeners, uh, that's what people most need from their church and their faith community. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure the faith leaders listening, the pastors will be paying attention to this. I don't think they're shocked by this result. I certainly am not, but it is instructive to hear what people have affirmed uh, via this poll. Their greatest need right now is community. And I suppose if you have been locked away and not able to move around a lot because of physical and even social distancing and not be able to go to church, for example, as you normally would in a physical sense, the, the, the necessity for community looms even larger. And, uh, and, the, and there's a way, of course, that we, we have to provide for that using a multiplicity of tools, both physical and digital. So thanks very much for all who participated in the polls. Thank you very, very much. And um, this ends the second segment of our dialogue. So thank you very much. So I welcome back the panelists to our third segment. And if you just joined us, we, you are listening, viewing ECCB Digital Dialogues. Our focus tonight is faith, uh, pandemic and faith. And our theme is hope in the face of adversity. So now let's go to the Q&A box and see if we have any questions for the panel. Let's go to the Q&A box and see if we have any questions for the panel. So... Here is a question uh, from one. What is the panelist's view about individuals who refuse to don masks at church gatherings 
citing the need to exercise faith in God to keep us safe. Interesting question. What is the view of the panelists of individuals who go to church and refuse to don masks, citing faith in God uh, for their safety and their protection? Uh, who would like to take that one? But that's one or all of us would have to give our view. <laughs> Uh, Pastor Connor, go ahead and give your, give your view. <laughs> well, um, we are required to, to, to wear masks when going into public spaces. So we have, uh, and we have given a commitment that we are going to do that. So we uh, ensure that at their door, that individuals have their masks. We believe that there should be a balance between um, public health and um, our religious liberties. and. For us, that is not um, a challenge. Uh, it is what we are asked to do, and we we respect that. So, so that's my 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 short answer to that. And and I would I would further add that we may have our own individual personal feelings about the uh, public health safety precautions, but I I still believe that it is necessary for us to govern ourselves to ensure that we try to protect ourselves and others in this time. Right, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Connor. Um, Bishop, please. Yeah, um, going uh, according to the polls we had just a while ago, and uh, community ranking the highest in the, in the polls of what is most needed um, by the public. Um, I think, you know, the fact that people ought to be or they are, and it ought to be community-minded, is, is, is an indication of our responsibility to community. Um, I mean, I don't like the mask, and I'm sure most people don't like the mask, but it is a protective measure for the sake of the community. And, I, I'm, and in that regard, I think um, sacrifice is needed. We need to make the sacrifice um, to, to accommodate others so that everybody will be safe. So that is my response to that, basically. Right, right. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Sister Tewitt, would you like to comment as well? Well, I agree, because um, wearing the mask doesn't mean that we don't have faith in God. We're simply following the government's instructions, and the explanation given is that we'll be protecting others. And it would be selfish of me not to wear a mask when I can infect somebody. So I think that we must wear the mask. It has nothing to do with um, trusting God. Right. So I, I just want to add to that, that, um, you know, the principle here, and I know you, you would appreciate that, is that um, churches are supposed to respect governmental authority. And the scripture is very clear on that in Romans 13, 1, and I believe Matthew 22, 21. You know, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. When it comes to health and these protocols, uh, the church has to operate under governmental authority, and there has to be some partnership, some working together. Um, and you mentioned the issue of protection. Now, what I've seen in some cases is, a, is a, an attempt to create a, a conflict between the church and state where you know, there's an assumption that the church is somehow, the state is trying to, to shut the church or keep the church down. Um, and the basic principle, I mean, again, as a person of faith, is that we are to work with the governmental authorities unless there's an absolute conflict, and then the higher power is God. Right. But in this case, there is a need for working together. And I think most of the re responsible leaders have chosen that path um, to protect their citizens, their, their, their their community, their churches, their members, and of course to comply with, with the, the state regulations. And um, so far, certainly in the Caribbean, I think for the most part, we've been able to manage that. Okay, thanks for those responses. Let's see what other questions we have. What spiritual hope can we discuss to give light to young professionals to keep them positive with focused efforts at reaching their dreams? What spiritual hope can we offer to professionals 
uh, to keep them positive and focused on reaching their dreams. Any, any reflections on that? What do we say to young people at this time? Young and ambitious who perhaps feel that, they're, that they are being sidetracked or their, their dreams and hopes are being derailed. They may be were planning to go off to university and now the path seems closed, at least for the moment. Either the finances are not there or they can't physically travel, even though, of course, online options are available. Perhaps they were starting a business. Now they've seen the economy uh, basically go into a difficult moment and uh, they're wondering what, what happens. What, what can we say to these young people? Anyone? Hmm. They need to understand that this is not something new. Throughout the years, we have been having not pandemics, but we've been having hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, things which interrupt our day-to-day -day life. It's just part of the process of living, and they just have to be patient. There's hope. So they just have to be patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Thank patience. You. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, please. I think here is where, uh, again, as Sister Chirith was saying, um, and it underscores again the whole premise of our discussion on faith, that earlier we were talking about being held together, even in tough times. So helping you to discover that identity where you do understand and appreciate that Life will be filled with um, valleys and mountaintop experiences. And so um, in this particular valley, uh, there is still the opportunity to go to the mountaintop. They might be delayed, but not denied. And uh, I believe that uh, an understanding uh, of Psalm 139 that we are made for a specific purpose and, and all of our days are numbered in God's book. Uh, it helps young people who have that um, underpinning to appreciate that uh, this may be an opportunity for them to uh, look closely at what they were planning on doing and maybe uh, they may have a change of heart. They may have a, a different conviction of what they should be doing. Um, they may have um, a, a new beginning. And so it, it is an opportunity to reevaluate to some extent, uh, maybe what their plans have been and to not necessarily chase, as I would say, a dollar value, but actually chase the potential that is within them because it, it provides an opportunity even for young people to re-engage their talents and their energies uh, and to look at new vistas of opportunities. So they may get into uh, different business ventures or they may see other areas coming on stream in colleges that uh, really um, guide them going forward. The area of, of choice that they were going to pursue uh, might become um, very uh, obsolete in, 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 in short order, and they now might be able to rethink. So I think it provides an opportunity, and young people who are given appropriate guidance and support during this time will do extremely well. I think they would, would do well to speak to someone who can um, guide them and help them through and to be part of a community that understands their trials and have been through similar experiences like Sister um, Joyce Lynn mentioned earlier and provided kind of support that is necessary because as young people, they can be a little anxious and feel like if it's not done now, it's not gonna be done again. And so I think that that help would be appropriate at this time. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Bishop? Yeah. Um, there, there are various things at play there. Um, and of course, each individual will approach the situation differently. Um, that will depend on the person's formation. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it would challenge the ability for the person to be patient, to be patient, to see that we are in a situation that is not normal. Uh, it was not created by one person. and uh, so, so it's a question of having the ability to cope with the, with the present situation. Secondly, 
um, the, the, the question of creativity to uh, that the person will, will, will see the possibility of him, him or herself being creative in finding other avenues to use their energy. Um, then, of course, we the question of the availability of of the partnership within community. Uh, again, we go back to the community and the and the the importance of the support that community can provide for any individual person who is going through um, various challenges in their life. So it is a complex question. Why did some very simple, but um, we have a person who uh, has particular needs, but are trying to channel their own energies in a way that, 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 that they see best fit. I think all the factors, the question of the, the ability of an individual to be patient, to understand what, what we are experiencing as a community, um, the direction that they will get from family and friends and so forth, and the ability to be creative in finding new avenues to, uh, to expand their energies. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Thank you, Bishop. And all three of you mentioned patience, which takes us back to Romans 12, 12. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Um, young people, remember that in this time. That's good advice for all of us, young and not so young. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, so let's see. Have our governments channel resources through faith-based organizations support support people through the pandemic? Have our governments channel resources through faith-based organizations to support people through the pandemic? Uh, are you aware any of you uh, as faith leaders of any particular resources from the state? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, anyone? No. Well, I I am not. Um knowledgeable of, uh, of any, um, but I'm not sure, okay, but I'm not sure to what extent um, in the context, because of course some governments and, and our local government has had um, what you, you termed uh, stimulus and different kind of uh, intervention. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I can't think of, uh, um, our context directly to faith-based organizations, but I, I can't say no, but not that I know of. Right, right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think obviously church members have benefited from these stimulus programs, these care yeah. and relief packages. Yeah. Um, uh, but as you said, the state has not been sending money to church. And tr truth be told, the state itself is challenged. That's Many right. of them are operating with 50% of revenues uh, as, you know, pre-COVID. They now down revenues and they've been asked to help everyone, you know, across the economy who are out of jobs and so on. So it's a very difficult time for the state. So, um, of course, wherever partnerships can be found, they should be pursued. But right. I, I do want to spare thought for our governments who are really struggling with their revenues at this very difficult period. Let's go back to the Q&A, please. So here is a question. What were the, what are the greatest needs that you have seen in the community? Um, I'm not sure if you want to comment on this. What are the greatest needs that you have seen emerge in your community? So for within your flock, what, what are you seeing? Well, to respond first, I, I think that the question of employment is really, really key. Um, a lot of people have lost jobs and everybody would like to, to have something to do. So that is mm -hmm. one, um, because you, you see, you have more people on the streets right now. I mean, the social programs that uh, were already existing and they have broadened in most, most um, islands in Dominica. I mean, I, I speak to the bishops of the region and um, the, 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 the number of people that they feed on average has quadrupled in some cases, you know. Um, so that's a great need on the, on the street. So question of, 
of jobs and of course feeding people where, where necessary and uh, providing for psychological needs for counseling and so forth these are these are the areas that I'll, I'll be able to raise right thank yeah. you thank you bishop one of the things Please, one, pass the one of the things that i thought about when we were going to have this discussion is uh, even though we are discussing on a regional level how diverse the the region is um still and yet there are still uh, subcultures within those cultures in terms of some islands, the, the, um, the geographical distances and stuff. Uh, and so I know that in different islands, you're gonna have different um, emphasis on, on needs. And notwithstanding the obvious unemployment in our context, my personal uh, experience has been that uh, most persons are interested in, in, in counseling. I have seen an uptick in relational uh, challenges, especially in, in families, uh, which, is, which is very heartbreaking and disheartening uh, because to my mind, there have, there have been uh, some conflicts that were existing. And I think that the, the pandemic uh, in terms of the challenges uh, heightened those uh, conflicts. And so that has been, for me, uh, very, very um, sad. I see lots of families really in need of, 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 of real counseling. And then you have domestic violence. Um, that That is just really heartbreaking. And so my own experience has been a real focus on the counseling element and the domestic abuse concerns. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Very sobering. Um, Sister Joycelyn, do you want to comment on this one as well? Not much to comment. My um, congregation is small and we don't have those issues. The, um, right. the only issue I found was the, the lack of community. We had some elderly persons in the congregation and they dearly love to go to church. We, we had our services via Zoom, but they, you know, they didn't have access to Zoom, so they felt left out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in terms of, you know, unemployment, abuse, that kind of thing, you know, we, um, it's just that, you know, the lack of fellowship, because even now, although the numbers, the number for social gathering has increased, we still, you know, persons are still afraid to come to church. So that is the only issue that we have at this point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a number of churches have had to continue their Zoom offerings, even as they uh, return to the physical church to accommodate members who, for health reasons perhaps, do not want to be exposed. Or in some cases, some cases uh, the churches themselves are small in size, and therefore they are challenged in terms of the distance and their capacity is obviously significantly reduced. And so they've had to ensure that they continue to offer the Zoom platform for those who want to be part of the service but cannot uh, physically attend church. Right, so thanks for that. Uh, let's perhaps take uh, two more questions. I, I think if we have any more, let's see. What is the level of stewardship that the panelists expect from their congregations during this pandemic? Mm. What is the level of stewardship uh, well, the question was asked, so I put it to you. What is the level of stewardship that uh, you are expecting from your congregants, your members in this period? Any comment on that? Well, my comment is that um, we are all called to be the best steward that we can be. 
Um, if we are accustomed of giving, it, we will continue to give. We may be able to give less at a given time, but we will give. Um, so from the point of view of expectation, I would say that I expect um, the, the faithful to, to, be, to be good stewards. Um, as to how that will translate into reality, I don't know. But from the level of expectation, I expect that um, we will try our utmost to be the best um, steward that we can be. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, following up on what the bishop said, I, I think uh, when we think of stewardship, uh, I, I imagine that the question concerns finances, but of course, there's stewardship of so many different things, uh, including individuals' time. And um, I think that that also is a part of stewardship. Uh, and everyone has had to make adjustments in terms of their, their, their school, their jobs, their, that, that sort of stuff. I, I would say in relation to um, stewardship uh, of finances, of your time and all of that, but specifically finances, that we, we focus on individuals giving cheerfully, regularly, and willingly. And whatever that looks like um, to the individual, um, that is a matter for their own conscience. But really, as, as a, a faith leader in this time, I, I, I emphasize with, with, with my people, and I think that it has demonstrated within the, the, the body how much as, as churches that we ourselves have not done the work that's necessary. Um, we have not had the appropriate contingency planning and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, now um, we can barely uh, support the work of the church uh, uh, plus so, uh, assisting uh, the individuals. And uh, that, is, that, that is unfortunate because individuals really are not able to give some of them as much or anything at all, um, really, when you think about it. Um, and I, I'll give a classic example. We, we were uh, making some assistance to uh, some of our members and uh, one individual came to me afterwards and said, um, Pastor, I was so happy because it was just this morning. I was thinking I didn't have an offering to give at church and I don't have any money to give an offering. So I was so glad when I got it. The first thing I did was to open it and take out and put in the offering. Now, some people might not uh, agree with me or they may not like this, but I kind of found that a little strange. Like, uh, you know, um, <laughs> you don't have any money. I don't know. I mean, we can take it in different, different, different directions. But really, individuals who love God and, and love the work of God or whatever, they are going to give what they can when they can. And that is my approach, really. Uh, individuals, you give what you can when you can, but there is absolutely no demand upon you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. But um, some of us, especially the elderly, they're trained in such a way that they must give to God because whatever they have is a gift from God. And if it means denying themselves to put that offering in the place, they'll do it. And I agree with you, Sister Joyce Lynn, but I want to follow up on that because um, uh, for me, these are very touchy emotional issues, um, so you would forgive me. But here is where I believe that sometimes we have to save people from themselves. And while it is true that they will do that, then I believe the church must have an appropriate outreach follow-up mechanism that will visit those individuals so that if it is that they have given their last and don't have anything, we will take bread to them because I really believe that while that is the way that they have been trained, and I grew up with my grandparents, so I'm trained that way too. But while that's the way that they have been trained, we cannot take it for granted that there are people who will give away their last dollar and don't have anything and say the Lord will provide. 
And while that is true, I believe that the Lord will provide for us. And so here is where I believe that that community becomes in, increasingly important, that the church has those safety nets whereby those individuals, once they have given, um, we can know their needs and in turn, try to assist them the best way we can. Mm -hmm. In the Methodist churches, every Sunday that we have communion, we normally have it once a year, but once a month, sorry. And on our communion service, we pick up a care fund for the less fortunate. So we actually would have that in case somebody needs help. And yeah, up. Yes. We also would have a list of persons who really need help. So every month we will give them something. But apart from that, if there's somebody in the community who is destitute or has an urgent need, we actually have a fund, an outreach fund for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um... Uh, that that is so important. I know of one church that started what they call a box of hope, where one of the members lost a job, uh, lost work, and uh, was out of work, and they brought a food basket, and the the member was the, was so touched because it was so needed that the response of the member to receiving that food basket inspired the church to start a campaign in the community uh, with food baskets. Uh, care and relief packages, and um, that morphed into a, a box of hope campaign. And um, I, I know, you know, in a previous, in the previous uh, dialogue, we were speaking about food security. And um, in Saint Vincent and the Grenadines, they have the love box, which is agricultural produce that are, you know, distributed to homes. Um, the state is involved in that, so it's farmers selling their produce to the state. The state then they're distributing. Um, my point is that this is a period for us to get, as the bishop said, creative, um, and as Pastor Connor said, to be discerning uh, members who are in need. So we really have to be in touch, and the church has to give back as much as it can. So uh, in this period, the church has to give back more mm -hmm. than perhaps it's done uh, because of the, the hurting of its members mm -hmm. and the community. And I, I think Sister Tewitt said earlier, not just the members in the church, but the community in which you operate. And then those of us who are people of faith also have to give more uh, in this period. So people, whether it's family, whether it's people in the community, uh, we have to give more. Recently, I was supporting a UWI campaign to help a number of students who at UWI who are in danger of not being able to complete their education because funds have dried up. You know, sources that they were relying on are no longer available. The economy, obviously, the economy is in a difficult um, period. So we have to do more. Uh, for some of us, it means a little less, getting by with a bit less so that we could give a bit more to those who are in need. Uh, as people of faith, that's what we do. So it's not just the church, mm -hmm. but I, I think the onus is on those of us who are people of faith. And, you know, there are people who may not even ascribe to a faith, but who recognize in the generosity of their heart and spirit necessity to give to those who are less fortunate in this period. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the community. That is part of the caring as a region uh, that is so important in this period. So yes, the safety nets, the states will do what the state will do what it can. Uh, the church must do what it can. As individuals and families, we do what we can. And it's the combination of these uh, safety nets that will help us in this period to sort of sustain um, during this turbulence until we're able to to get to the other side. So thank you for sharing. It's a sensitive but a very important topic and I'm glad the question was raised. And thank you for your responses. Do we have any more questions? We don't. So perhaps we could uh, uh, go back to the panel and um, look to conclude with a final couple of questions uh, if we can. And so I want to perhaps ask you to just for a moment, um, I'll ask the bishop, but then others can also weigh in. Um, as we craft regional and, and, and national plans for recovery and resilience, what areas uh, are you keen to see addressed in these plans? 
So a number of our governments are working on these national recovery plans. Mm -hmm. The ECC visit itself is also working on a regional recovery plan to support our governments. Right. Uh, what would you like to see addressed? Any areas you want to highlight? Um, you know, there is a very significant point that our sister Tuit raised in her first uh, her, her initial oh. discussion, the question of ecology, the ecological question, and uh, the uh, and the responsibility we have towards it and what it has it has done to 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 affect change in uh, in people's perception of of today's reality it is certainly a question that that is very dear to me um just incidentally just to, to share with you that this very month um from the 1st of september to the 4th of october the holy father francis has designated as a season of creation um with an attempt to help people realize the, the tremendous need there is to respect our earth as our common home. Um, and to have, to, 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 to re-examine our relationship with that common home. Now, um, it might be a little away from, from the topic of the, the, the pandemic and so forth, but I see it connected because um, very often we, we, we take our, 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 the earth for granted and, uh, and we need to have a greater relationship with it to see how um, our actions can endanger um, the, the natural order. Um, so that any effort we make to build a healthier earth, a healthier world, would certainly take us to some distance in, in helping affecting all the, the, the various things that we're concerned about today, including including pandemic. We have a responsibility, I think, to, to, to build a healthy, healthy society, but a healthy, a healthy world. In fact, if I'm to, I'm to quote that from the popes, from John Paul II to this present pope right now, um, regards the ecological question as a moral question. The responsibility we have to take for the earth, which is the common home of all of us, is a moral question. It means what we, the decisions we take in that, in, in, in regard to the earth, can affect everybody. Um, we, we, we can, of course, talk about the pandemics, but we can talk about also the hurricanes, the frequency of hurricanes. Why is it? Why is it the way that it is right now? Because the world has been affected in a way that. Uh, I don't know if, it's, if, it, if it is reversible, but we hope that it is reversible. But if it is to be, it is a responsibility that we have to take. So that's one, one, one issue that I would like to see addressed and that we, we uh, take a little more concern about. Just um, um, incidentally, the government in, in Dominica has certainly been doing quite a bit in that regard, um, claiming that we would like to make Dominica the first climate resilient country in the world, you know, um, and, uh, and certainly plans are afoot for that. But to look at more regionally, I think we need to um, work on a little more cooperation among ourselves. We see the demise of LIAT, for example, and what has gone bad about it and where it is at the moment. I'm trying to rise up above the water. Um, we ask ourselves, why is it that way? Uh, can, are, are we not able as, uh, uh, as a region to come together and uh, provide uh, an air transport in a way that, that, would, that would be helpful to the region? These are questions I'm, I'm posing. Um, then our political situations, we, we need to look at. Why would a region such as ours allow the situation that happened in Guyana, for example. You know, why why should that ever happen? And of course, we can extend it to to, to Suriname as well. Why should should those things happen? Are, are we not able to 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 uh, guide our people in a way that is more a little more neat? Can our politics be a little more neat than than it has been? I think these are questions. Then we, we, we could look at the questions of um, the, 
insurance for our people, the health for, for our people, catering for the unemployment which we have, we, which we have, um, we have raised earlier. What are the, 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 the situations we put in place, the conditions we put in place to address those issues for our, our people? Then we, we can go on the question of family, family life and our youth. What attention do we give to them? Um, we, we live in a, in, a, in a culture in the Caribbean that is very much, we would call a very party culture. A lot of monies and effort are uh, being expended um, on partying, you know? Um, and of course, we have to socialize and so forth. But, but um, yeah, in the process, are we, are we sufficiently being creative and uh, providing a future that, that is more positive, that is more um, wholesome for our people? These us that I would like to, to see addressed so that um, we would be able to develop a much healthier society as a Caribbean people, a more united society as a Caribbean people that would, would certainly bring us forward into, into the future. Mm -hmm. All right. thank, thank you, Bishop. And I, I just want to clearly underscore the very first point you made about environmental justice. Mm -hmm. Clearly, as people of faith, we are required to protect the environment. This is not a liberal issue or conservative issue. I mean, we make a nonsense of these serious issues when we put them in these packages and try to label people. And certainly coming from the Caribbean and small states, we appreciate that. The climate crisis is real. It's real. And by the way, you, you, you mentioned it's linked to the pandemic. It is absolutely linked to the pandemic. It is, it is. Because what the scientists are saying to us is that we could see more pandemics as a result of climate change, mm -hmm. the climate crisis. So if we think this is bad, worse could come. So we have to take the climate crisis seriously. And of course, we have the most to lose because we're the smallest, but we're the hardest hit. Smallest emitters, but hardest hit. And um, we have to continue to add our voice. And I know the church, some churches do, but. I think the collective voice of the church is important on this issue of climate as well. We can't be, we can't be in deniers of the climate. When we are living the issue, Sister Tweed spoke to the fact that we've seen coral reefs um, destroyed. Why is that happening? Because of global warming, the bleaching of the, of the, of the corals. And that has a direct effect on our fisheries, which is an important part of our food security and our protein uh, source of protein. I mean, it, it goes on and on, and we have to connect the dots. So on environmental justice, this is, it is more than, it is a moral issue, as you put it, uh, and, and people of faith have to also take a stand on that. So when we, for example, the Central Bank made a commitment to green our campus, and essentially to have a zero net or net zero emissions by 2022, and at this moment, we are well on our way. At least 60% of our needs are now generated from renewables, solar PV. That was a very conscious decision. And we made it for the environment. We also made it for bottom line because we're saving money uh, when, we, when we do that. And we now are saving money. But also to have the moral authority to make the argument in our advocacy on the issue of climate change mm -hmm. and to call out large states especially the emitters, the large emitters of greenhouse gases, to do more in this area. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop there because I don't want to continue, but it's a very important issue for our region. But you mentioned other things. You, you spoke about the question of community, uh, health, uh, health care, um, regional cooperation, and so on. So I don't want to repeat. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone wish to add to this uh, on this point? Okay. Not much, except to uh, reinforce what one of the dialogues uh, subject was, uh, the, the whole idea of food security. I think that we have not done a good job uh, in relation to that, and, and not in the individual territories, but even through co cooperation um, within the region. 
And I think that that's something that we definitely have to, to work on. But in addition to that, I would like to see um, more um, policy and, and, and real work going into the development of small businesses. We've seen many small businesses flounder. Um, we talk a good talk about small business development, but there isn't the support that is uh, available to small business people. And I think uh, in, in terms of assisting, we can uh, create more collaboration with small business developers so that in, instead of going it alone, they would learn to operate as a team and probably accomplish more. So I definitely would like to see more work done um, in, in terms of developing the skills that um, is driving some of our people so that they'll be able to develop those skills and be successful business people. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Connor. Well, let me um, put the final question to our panelists. And that is, we started this evening with the theme, hope in the face of adversity. And so as we close out, I'd like to invite you to offer some words of hope and encouragement to all people of our region, especially our youth, but to all of us, because we are all impacted by this pandemic. So uh, Sister Truett, would you like to start? Unmute. Unmute your mic, please. Right. I didn't hear the question. Oh, the question is, this is our final question. What words of hope and encouragement would you like to offer to the people of our region? Oh. I'll say that um, the situation is critical, but it is not hopeless. We, it will take time for us to adapt to the new changes. But I'm confident that things will get better. Right now, some persons, they're feeling depressed. They're feeling helpless. But hope is on the way. The key to, to this is that we share our experiences with others. We don't just keep it build up, built up inside of us. We talk about it. And so when we talk about it, it would make us feel better. And talk to persons with, who really believe that things are going to get better. Because we need that inner strength to, to go on. It's not a matter of just saying, yes, I know God is good and that things are going to get better. We, we have to really believe that things are going to get better. Because as we look throughout the Bible, we see people who have gone through much and we've seen them survive. For instance, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, Pharaoh's army was behind of them and the Red Sea was ahead. And some of them, they lost all hope because the situation had looked so hopeless. But God intervened. And so my word tonight is that giving up should not be an option. Oh, God is faithful, and he can make the impossible possible. And he always finds a way out, even when there seems to be no way. So I'm saying, just hold on and keep believing that God will see you through. Right. Thank you, Sister Tui. He is the way maker. Bishop? Yeah. I want us to look at this pandemic as something that we are in. 
in it all together. And it calls us to a deeper sense of unity. It calls us also to, to focus on the more positive aspects of it. I raised as a point earlier on the question of the, the family advantage that came out of it. People having opportunities to be, to spend more time with family. We need to look at those um, positive aspects. In fact, what I would like to hope that when we come out of, when we, we do come out, because we will come out, when we do come out of the, the COVID situation, that we will not be the same people, that we would have learned a great lesson, that we, have, we would have learned from the, the experience of being together, working together, sharing together, uh, and doing all the things together, that it would have taken us from what was previous our comfort zone, that we experienced a little discomfort together, but we are moving into another zone where we have learned so much that we'll be a different kind of people. Um, I just want to refer back to the meltdown in 2008. Um, after that, everybody was looking for normalcy, coming back to normal. Today, we use the language of um, a new normal. But mm -hmm. whatever, whatever the new normal will be, I would, like to, I would like to pray that it becomes a normal that is more humanizing for us, that we would have learned sufficiently with our God, journeying with our God, uh, to come to the deeper realization that he is calling us to a different space a different space that will lead us to the destiny that we have on earth. I always make the remark that the one thing that God is concerned about in our regard is our salvation. God wants all of us to be saved. But the salvation, in a sense, is in our hands. He has given us every possibility. He has provided us with the gifts to make it happen. Whatever responsibility we take in life, is a step towards that salvation. And I hope that this pandemic will have created the environment where we see the need for such discipline, to have such a disciplined mind that we can be heading towards a greater future. And I have tremendous hope for that future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Pastor Connor, one minute. What would you like to say in your parting words? Well, at the onset, I said, uh, faith holds us together so that we don't fall apart when the tough time comes. And I want to um, challenge individuals to be mindful of this, that like Joseph, uh, God is with them because we are here in this season for a specific reason. And because God has uh, ordained our steps, and Psalm 139 reminds us that, before we were found in the inward parts, he knew us and he numbered all of our days. He has us here for a specific reason. And as a result, I believe that we can reframe whatever circumstances come to us like they, that Joseph did when he, he confronted his brothers and he simply said, you did this to me for evil, but God meant it for good. And it is that type of reframing, I think, that is critically important. And so I would encourage individuals to reframe their circumstances and continue to dream big dreams and visions because I, I believe that uh, tomorrow the sun will shine brighter than today. And there is, there is always hope uh, if we have that faith in God that uh, we are being held together even in the tough times so that we do not fall apart and we are kept together because tomorrow the strength that we will need, God will give it to us to make the journey bright. I just want to say this, that Walt Disney, um, we are told, died just um, um, sometime before the, the opening of the team pack. And at the opening, there were two ladies conversing. And one of them said, when the lights went on, that Walt should have been alive to see this. And the other lady turned to her and said, Walt did see it. If he did not see it, we would not have seen it. Because he saw it in his vision, he made it happen. And so I want to encourage young people to continue to have a vision, to continue to believe, and continue to trust in God. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Connor. So with that, it's just left for me to thank our panel for sharing their insights and, um, and their words of hope and encouragement to all of us this evening. I, I thank you very much, and we want to wish you God's blessings in your ministry in this spirit and going forward. So thank you very much, or many thanks to you. I'd also like to thank our broadcast partners uh, who joined us for the broadcast this evening. But I especially want to thank all of our listeners and viewers who stayed with us for the last two hours. Uh, we hope that you found this uh, encouraging and that you would be fortified as we move forward and we navigate this pandemic together. To my colleagues at the Central Bank, I'd like to mention them as well. Dr. Emma Fasodo, who is the coordinator of this dialogue, and she works in the governor's office. Alston Crawford, Marlon Bristol, Shana Daniel, Karina Philip Somersall, Janelle Brathwaite, uh, Shermelan Kirby, Carissa St. Just, Elizabeth Whelan, Lyndon Jackassel, and if I forgot any member, I thank you all. And finally, again, I end where I started Romans 12, 12. Always, always, let us be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Good evening. God bless you all. Thank you.